So we're going to continue now in the life of Christ. We'll be continuing here in Luke chapter 11. Now, if you were here last week, we were looking at the first four verses of Luke chapter 11. And we said of what is often the Lord's Prayer today that it's a great Old Testament prayer. It's a wonderful prayer under the Old Covenant. The idea that we forgive in order to be forgiven. The notion that we continue to ask God to forgive us of our sins is a wonderful Old Testament concept, but it is not a New Testament concept. We discussed that, and look, we can debate whether or not this is an appropriate prayer for a New Testament believer to pray today. Certainly there are principles that we looked at, wonderful principles of prayer in this prayer, which was of course first given during the Sermon on the Mount back in Matthew chapter 6. And so some, and mainly because of tradition and what they're used to, would maybe argue the point that this is something we should pray today, and that's fine if we could have that discussion or that debate, for lack of a better word, but what cannot be debated biblically is that our forgiveness is complete in Christ, that once we come to the Lord, we are forgiven, fully forgiven, we are washed clean in the blood of Christ, all sin, past, present, and future, has been forgiven. We are fully, totally redeemed. And so that is something that cannot be argued. And we looked at the references last week to that. And just one right now we'll give again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us. This is Jesus. Bearing sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so Jesus takes our sin, gives us his righteousness. And though we still sin, that sin is forgiven. It's now appropriate to tell God we are sorry, to ask God for help, for grace, help us do better next time. But it really is no longer appropriate to feel the need to ask God to forgive us again and again and again. We are forgiven once and for all, redeemed once and for all. And so if you want to retain this prayer as a New Testament prayer, that has to somehow be reconciled with the fact that we are fully forgiven already. And we went through the reasons last week why Jesus would have given this prayer to them again. And certainly to show them their continual need for mercy and grace, the continual understanding that without him there is no hope at all. We need his mercy, his grace, his complete forgiveness through his blood. And so you can of course go back and listen to what we did last week. Well, this morning now, we will continue here in Luke 11. We're going to be looking at verses 5 through 13 this morning. And this is more teaching on prayer. And I would say that when we look at this and study this together, this becomes very encouraging teaching on prayer. And it's applicable both to the believer and to the unbeliever. What we're going to see here today. Now to the unbeliever, we praise God that mercy and grace is available. Because no one forgives perfectly. That's why Jesus says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. It's an impossible standard. We don't forgive perfectly. We don't keep the law perfectly. We don't do anything perfectly. Some might say, well, is there any hope then? Well, there is hope in the grace of God. What we're going to read today is very similar to something Jesus gives towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount as well, in Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11, which, again, at that point, all that Jesus has said, 
the full law that he has given, the true law, the righteousness of God he's presented, some may be left wondering, is there any hope then at all? And of course the hope is found in Jesus. And those who truly seek his grace, those who truly humble themselves before his righteousness, those who confess as the tax collector did in Luke 18, verse 13, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, will indeed experience God's mercy and God's forgiveness of their sin. So to the unbeliever, this next portion of Scripture becomes a great encouragement to realize as bad as we may be, as bad as they may be, as sinful as they may be, and as hopeless as they may be, there's always hope in the gospel. There's always hope in grace. And then to the believer, what we're going to read here today encourages us too that mercy and grace remain available. It's not just at salvation that we need mercy and grace. It is every moment of every day as we know. With everything going on in this life, in this world, we need mercy, we need grace, it is available. It's available to all believers who boldly storm heaven's gates and ask for it. If you read many of the prayers in the Old Testament, many of the Psalms, these different psalmists and the way they prayed, they basically demanded that God listen to them. They basically came to God and said, I don't care what you're doing right now, you need to stop and listen to what I have to say. And as a child of God, though God is sovereign and God is holy and God is so far above us, we have that right today. As the child of God, we have the right, and we'll look at this more throughout this morning, but we have the right in Jesus Christ, only through his blood and only because of his grace. We have the right to storm heaven's gates. We have the right to demand that God give us a hearing. And so this encourages us as well. So a lot here today for us to look at. Before we do it, ask you to stand for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, Lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, Will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And Lord Jesus, once again, we're so grateful to be here today. We're grateful to be together to study your word today. We ask you, Holy Spirit, grateful that you have been given to us that you would teach us, encourage us, change us as only you can. And of course, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's get right into it this morning. Again, a wonderful, encouraging portion of Scripture 
for all who will listen, unbeliever and believer alike, great reason to find joy and strength in the words of our Lord here today. So verse 5, he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And so our Lord begins today with this story, really, of hospitality. Now at that time, it was really expected above almost anything else. It was expected, it was really demanded that people would be hospitable to one another. And someone, we see this in scripture even in various places, someone traveling on a journey looking for a place to stay, looking for some food or shelter. And especially if it's a friend or family member, you absolutely would provide that for them as much as you could. So Jesus tells the story here of someone who's traveling and perhaps unbeknownst to the future host that he would be stopping in so late but someone is traveling and he arrives at a friend's house and the friend has nothing for him to eat which of course would really be a big no-no you had to provide for a travel you would have to provide for a friend hospitality would demand that, just the normal way of things would demand that. And so what does he do? Well, the only thing he can do, he goes and he asks someone else for some food. He goes and he asks a neighbor. And it's very, very late, we're told. It's very, very late because this neighbor says, look, I'm already in bed. My children are in bed. Remember, very small houses, one-room houses in many cases. Part of it would be for sleeping. Everyone would sleep kind of together. It's late. We're in bed. Go away. And yet Jesus says in verse 8, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, because let's be honest, most friends are not quite this friendly. Most friends are not going to, in the middle of the night, get up and say, oh yeah, here, no problem. Do you want me to do this for you also? What else can I do for you? Most people are going to say, listen, come back in the morning, or you should have come a few hours ago. Most people are not going to just happily agree to do what this friend is demanding. So though he won't do it because he's his friend, because he's his neighbor, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. That word importunity there, it's a nice little word. It means one who is persistent, but not just persistent, but even troublesome, even annoying in their persistence. That's what the dictionary says. Troublesome, persistent, urgent, even annoyingly so. Ever known anyone like that? Probably we all have, and... Maybe we've been that way ourselves a time or two, and there's a little phrase, right? The squeaky wheel gets the grease. Sometimes it's not the worst thing to be importune, to be one of uh, this ilk at times. And so Jesus says, you know, he won't necessarily get up just because someone's asking him, but if you just keep asking, if this friend just keeps demanding, and says, you know, you're already awake because I'm keeping you up, so you might as well help me now, then eventually he's going to break him down. Eventually he's going to wear him down, and he'll just give him as much as he wants to make him go away in essence so they can get a little bit of sleep here tonight. It's kind of similar in that respect to a parable Jesus will later tell in Luke chapter 18. Recall the parable of the woman and the unjust judge who doesn't fear God or regard man at all, and yet because this woman keeps begging, keeps 
asking keeps helping. He just breaks down. He says, look, I'm just going to give her what she wants eventually. And Jesus said in verse 1 of Luke 18 that he told this, or the Bible says he told this parable to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. And so another encouragement similar to this, that we should keep praying, keep seeking, keep asking. And that is the lesson now that this story is meant to convey. This little story here, which would have been very understandable to them at this time, they would have known exactly what this kind of thing was like, exactly how much is demanded of someone when a traveler comes. This little easy to understand story is now meant to convey a lesson on prayer and seeking God. That's why verse 9 Jesus says, and I say unto you, so now here comes the lesson, here comes the truth in this. I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be be opened. Great, great truth here. First to the unbeliever and then to the believer. So first of all, to the unbeliever. We understand that none can seek God on their own. The Bible makes that abundantly clear. Jesus said in John 6, 44, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And I, of course, will raise him up at the last day. But men on their own do not seek God. Our sinful hardened hearts do not allow us to. That's why Jesus will later say, Luke 19, verse 10, the Son of Man is come to seek and save the lost. Because the lost were not seeking Him, the lost cannot save themselves, but Jesus came to seek us. He came to seek us. And when He does, and when He imparts His grace, when his spirit is moving upon an individual, upon a heart, then whoever will then humbly take God at his word, acknowledge they are bad, he is good, they are depraved, he is gracious, and will come humbly seeking him for mercy, will receive it. Again, this is exactly what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He brought the people to the point where they could, unless they were just so hardened or so careless of anything he said, brought the people to a point where they would have to admit, yes, we are bad, we are depraved, we are not righteous, God is, therefore we need major, major help. We need major, major grace. We are lost sinners in need of saving grace, in need of forgiveness. That's where Jesus brought them in that sermon. That's where the word of God will bring any sinner whose heart is opened to the Spirit of God. And Jesus now says, if that's you, if you are a sinner still lost in sin, you recognize your need for forgiveness, hopeless on your own, but realizing there is hope in God. Because as he says, everyone that asketh receiveth. Because everyone is a lost sinner, yet anyone can become a justified saint. There is no hope anywhere else, but there is hope in God. There is hope in grace. There is hope for all, again, who will say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Who truly, from their hearts, believe that, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You see, the law breaks us down. The law condemns us. The righteousness of God buries us. So that the grace and the mercy and the cross of Jesus Christ can raise us up to new life. And so all who will come, recognizing that, 
will receive. All who will come asking for mercy and grace will find mercy and grace. And though salvation was ordained before time began, and we know that the Bible makes that abundantly clear, God in his sovereignty chose us for salvation. God in his sovereignty chose Jesus as his son, ordained that he would die for the sins of men. God is sovereignly in control of all things. That is true, yet this is also true. None who sincerely come will be turned away. As we always like to point out, the sovereignty of God and the free will of man working together in a perfect way, and we would have it no other way. Why would we want to have it any other way? Why would we, in a million years, attempt to lessen one of those great truths in order to uphold the other, though many have done that. Similar as well to the fact that God is sovereign, yet prayer is powerful. That's a big part of all this too. God remains sovereign. God's plan remains on track. How all of this works, I have no idea. But I know the Bible teaches God is in full control, and I know the Bible teaches prayer is powerful to change things. Somehow it all works. You see, with God, the quote-unquote competing truths, the things that would seem to be opposites, all are true nonetheless. God is both fully holy, just, vengeful, hateful of sin, yet completely loving, merciful, gracious, and kind. Men have free will, yet God is totally sovereign. It all works somehow. God is all of it, as we like to say, and praise him that he is. So yes, God has ordained those who will be saved to that salvation. And yes, those who humbly come, those who acknowledge their need for mercy and grace will find it. And so to the unbeliever, what a great promise. That there is hope, there is mercy, there is redemption available. Yet to the believer, what a great promise as well. A great promise that the truth of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 is alive and well today. I'm going to read that right now. Actually, I'm going to go back a little further in Hebrews chapter 4. What a great book Hebrews is, of course. And in Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 12, actually, this wonderful statement on the Word of God. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And even that shows us the sovereignty of God. His word, it cuts to the heart. It understands the heart in a way nothing else can. Verse 13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So again, God is sovereign over all. God sees everything. Nothing can hide from him. There's nothing he does not understand. He does not know. And then we keep going. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. <clears throat> Let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Great statement right there. Incredible statement right there. That Jesus, fully God, fully man, knows exactly what it's like, to be man, knows exactly what it's like to 
be troubled, to be tempted, all of it. And then this in verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So God's word is powerful. God is sovereign. Yet with all that said, we can come to Jesus. We have a great high priest who is sovereign, who is all-powerful, who is completely good. We have a great high priest who knows what it's like to be man, who knows what it's like to struggle, to be tempted, yet without sin, to be tired and hungry and thirsty and stressed, to not know what's going to happen next sometimes in his humanity. We have this great high priest, and we then can come boldly unto the throne of grace. Boldly unto the throne of grace. You see, this really, <clears throat> really, this is too wonderful to even describe this verse right here. That, first of all, the throne which should be a throne of judgment, by all rights, by all accounts, this should be a throne of judgment. Yet because of the blood of Jesus, it's a throne of grace. It's a place now where those who have received grace continue to find grace and mercy in our time of need. Again, this is truly mind-boggling when you think about it. God's throne should be the place where he condemns us to eternal suffering where he sends us to eternal hell, to an eternal lake of fire, and yet, because of Jesus, and only because of Jesus, it's a throne of grace. And not only that, but we now can boldly come before him. <clears throat> we now can boldly come before it that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Again, it's really too incredible to even comprehend. You see, God is not, though he should be because he's God, God is not unapproachable like the monarchs of old. He's not unapproachable like today's monarchs either. Those who, in authority and power, would scoff at the fact that anyone would even question what they do or why they do it. God is not like that. For his child, his throne is open. It is open, it is gracious, and he tells us that we can come boldly to it. That is not how it worked. You might remember the book of Esther. Remember when Esther was being asked by Mordecai if she would go to the king on behalf of her people? And she says in chapter 4, verse 11, that everyone, <coughs> excuse me here today, <clears throat> but she said that everyone, all the king's servants, all the people in the king's provinces, everyone knows that if you come before the king without being summoned, you could die. In fact, that was a common occurrence. That was very common in ancient monarchs and ancient kingdoms. You don't just march into the throne room. You can't just demand a hearing with the king without being beckoned, without being invited 
to come. And so at first, as you know the story, Esther was very hesitant. And yet afterwards, by the grace of God, she went, and of course, everything worked out, praise God. But you compare that, you contrast that to God in his throne. These earthly monarchs who say, don't you dare come before me, you could die if you come before me, and yet the throne of God where we should justly die, where to look upon God's face we would die, a throne of judgment, which it still will be for all unbelievers, for all who fail to repent, a place where we should justly die, unlike the thrones of men. And yet in the mercy and grace of God, and because of the work of Jesus Christ, that throne is now a throne of grace. And rather than being barred from it, we are now invited to boldly come before it. We are now invited to boldly storm heaven's gates and enter heaven's throne because of what Jesus has done. And then you wonder why some of those great saints of old prayed the way they did. Because they were on praying ground. Because Jesus was their Savior, even if he had not yet died. Because they were children of God. And as a child of God, if we are children of God in here today, we can come before God anytime, any place, no matter what. And certainly then when Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 that we should pray without ceasing, certainly there's a component of this in that. The fact that we can pray without ceasing. The fact that God's throne is now open to us. That it's now a throne of mercy and grace. As Jesus says, ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. Again, to the unbeliever, come and repent and experience mercy and grace. To the believer, come boldly to a place where you should not be able to come, but now you are because of Jesus. Come boldly and demand a hearing with God and ask God and seek God and knock on heaven's door. Or better yet, just march right in and ask God what you want. Tell God what you need. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be open. You see, the character and nature of God is what inspires prayer like this. When we read the Bible, when we read God's word, when we come to church and hear God's word together, the more we know God, the more we understand who he is and what he says, the more we realize how good he is, how wonderful he is, how gracious he is, how welcome we are at his throne as his children. But we need to know these things. That's why we need to be in God's work. The prophet Hosea in chapter 4, verse 6, said of Israel, God said of Israel, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. He said the same thing earlier, the same thing a little bit later in that same chapter. It's because they lack the true knowledge of God, they were judged. Because they lack the true knowledge of God, they did not live as they were supposed to. The same is true with us. If we don't know what the Bible says, if we don't know who God is, then we are only hurting ourselves. Of course, we'll be judged forever for our sin if we don't know who God is. But then even as his children, if we don't read the scriptures, that's why we must be in our Bibles. We need as much of God's word as we can possibly get into us. 
every day. We need God's Word. Without knowing God's Word, we cannot know God. If we don't know God, we don't realize how good He is. We don't realize things like Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Or what Jesus is saying here. We must know God more through His Word. We must be like Mary, sitting at the feet of Jesus, as we saw a few weeks back. There in Luke 10, verses 38 through 42. Because the more we know God's Word, the more we sit at His feet the more boldly we will pray, knowing who it is we pray to and what he's already said, what he said of himself and therefore what is true of us. The more we know God's word, the more we can quote-unquote remind God of his promises. Not that we're actually reminding him, we're reminding ourselves. Another prayer that I love in the Bible is in the book of Genesis, chapter 32. It's actually found in verses 9 through 12. Jacob, at that point, prays to God because he's afraid of his brother Esau. He's afraid for his life, even. And so he boldly comes to God, and he reminds God of the promises he made to him. He reminds God of what God had already said. God had promised Jacob that he would bless him that he would be with him, that he would protect him. And at this point, he feels as if Esau, his brother, is about to kill him. And so he reminds God of what he already said. He shows boldness and faith in prayer, faith in the promises of God. We need to do the same thing. But how can we if we don't know what those promises are? How can we if we're not in God's work? And so, yes, ask, seek, knock. To the unbeliever, do that for salvation. Realize there is no hope anywhere else, but there's always hope in the sovereign grace of God. To the believer, realize there is no hope anywhere else, but there is always hope in the sovereign grace of God. For everyone that asketh, receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be open. But Jesus then continues here, verses 11 through 13, to further cement this point, to further prove how true this is, how willing God is to save sinners, how willing God is to encourage and strengthen saints. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, Jesus says in verse 11, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Well, by and large, no. I mean, there may be one or two out there, but you have to be worse than the worst to be this kind of a father. I mean, even the worst people that have lived, history tells us they love their own children. They would try to do good for their own children even. So really, hardly anyone, if anyone, would purposely, as a father, as a mother not only fail to help their child if they could, but actually do the exact opposite in the worst kind of way. Look at what Jesus says. If you ask for bread, would you give him a stone? Because they could be very similarly shaped. A little piece of bread could look like a stone. Or if you ask for a fish, we give him a serpent. That which could kill him instead of that which could sustain him. They could look kind of similar. Or even the scorpion, some scorpions were yellow when they're all crawled up, bundled up. They look like an egg. Would you give your child something that looks like an egg but could kill him on purpose? Or would you give him an egg? Would you give your child something that might resemble a fish but could kill him? 
Or would you give him a fish? Well, of course, if you could, there's not a father or mother alive probably who wouldn't do this. Just about at least everyone would do the best they could for their children. And as a father now, these sorts of things hit me even harder than they used to. I think about my own kids. And as evil as I am, as Jesus says in verse 13, as evil as we are, as bad and as selfish and as imperfect as I am, I would do whatever I could for my child. Well, how much more then? How much more then would a good, perfect, selfless God who selflessly left heaven and came to earth, selflessly died the worst death for the worst people, how much more would that God give good things to his children? A lot more. That's the answer, a lot more. So verses 11, 12, again, you'd be hard-pressed to find a father that wretched that he would do that. And that's why Jesus says now in verse 13, if ye then being evil, because we are, we all are, we go astray from the time we are born. In fact, David writes in Psalm 51, verse 5, that I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So we're, we're as dead as dead can be. We're conceived in sin. We're lost in sin. Totally depraved. So if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father, who is good, Psalm 1830, as for God, his way is perfect. Everything he does, totally and completely good. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? So to the unbeliever, our heavenly Father, as Jesus says to his disciples, your heavenly Father is willing to become anyone's father. He is willing to give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. He is willing then in essence to save them that ask him. Because though at this time he was not yet given to permanently indwell, soon he would be. Now at this time, of course, he is. At the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit indwells us. So if God... Or if we are evil, yet we know how to do good things. Certainly God, who is good, and we'll get to us in a second as his children, but God, the Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father, who created everyone, he's not the Father of everyone yet until they come to him, but though he created everyone, of course, so our Father is willing to become anyone's Father if they will simply ask and seek and knock if they'll come to the end of themselves and to the start of his grace, he will give them the Holy Spirit. He will save them. He will redeem them. The greatest gift is salvation. The answer to every problem, every question, every sin, every struggle, every stress is salvation. And God is willing to save and God will save all who with the heart of the tax collector say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And as verses 9 and 10 say, come asking and seeking and knocking and begging and pleading for his mercy and his grace. He will give the Holy Spirit to them. He will save them. He will redeem them. Praise God. But then to the believer, remember, you are the saved child of God already. If we're followers of Jesus, we are the saved children of God already. And God, as our Father, if our earthly fathers would do what they could to help us 
in our need. How much more will our good and sovereign and precious and wonderful and perfect and all-powerful Heavenly Father do whatever He can. Give us what we need. Give us the Holy Spirit in our time of need. You might say, well, why does He say the Holy Spirit again? Application to believer and unbeliever. To the unbeliever, you can have the Holy Spirit for the first time. You can be saved if you come and seek salvation. To the believer, you can be once again strengthened, filled by the Holy Spirit. Because just as the answer to every question and problem and sin and struggle is the grace and salvation of God, the answer to all that we need, the greatest help and comfort and wisdom and power is found in the Holy Spirit. Remember what the Bible tells us of the Holy Spirit. It tells us a lot, of course. Jesus will tell us a lot in the months to come in our study together. Remember what we read later on in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 of the fruit of the Spirit. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And then the Bible says, against such there is no law, because the law now has done its job. It's brought us to Jesus. And if you're walking in the Spirit, you don't need any law anyway, because certainly that Spirit, that fruit, will keep us in line. But think about that. If all of that is the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, all of that, if all of that is what the Holy Spirit offers us, then certainly He becomes the answer to us in our time of need as well. So in essence, God is saying, I will go above and beyond even what you are asking for. I will give you the Holy Spirit. I've already given you the Holy Spirit, and I will now have Him help you even more and strengthen you and encourage you and fill you and teach you and guide you even more. It's a greater answer than the original question, giving us of the Holy Spirit. If God is all of it, as we say, certainly His indwelling Spirit is all of it as well. And so to the unbelief, the lesson is simple. Come as you are willing to repent and receive mercy and grace. Come as you are because you're never going to get any better. Come as you are knowing how rotten you are. But come and sincerely ask God for mercy and grace and He will give it. And He will change you. And He will save you forever. To the believer, know who you are. Know who you are in Christ. Know that the way is now open. The curtain is now torn. The throne is now one of grace. And there is always grace to help in our time of need. For all of us, may we better understand the power of God which leads to the power of prayer. You see, prayer is only powerful because God is powerful. And yes, God is sovereign. We already said this. Don't ask me to explain how the sovereignty of God works with the prayers that we pray, but somehow it does. May we understand the power of God. May we understand the power of prayer. May we as God's people come boldly unto the throne of grace that we too may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. And then one final verse. 
The Apostle Paul would later write this through the Holy Spirit, of course. In Ephesians chapter 3, actually, it's the end of a prayer that he prays for the church there. It's a wonderful prayer that we could certainly pray today. At the end of that prayer, he says this, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Do you hear that? Do we hear that today? Jesus says, come and seek and ask and knock. And you will find answers. You will find grace. But he also tells us now through his servant Paul that not only will we find what we need or what we think we need, but he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. The Holy Spirit truly is all of it. God truly is all of it. So unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Let's pray. And Lord Jesus, we thank you so much today for your sovereign grace. We thank you, Lord, that though we were totally depraved, now we, we are your justified saints, your beloved children. We still sin all the time, but thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for the grace that helps us to hopefully sin less, and to follow you more. But Lord, thank you so much for this grace. Thank you that this grace is available to all who come and seek for it. Whether to the unbeliever to be redeemed for the first time, or to the believer to find grace to help each and every day in our need. We thank you, Lord God. We praise you, Lord God for your mercy and for your grace. We ask you would help us today now to come boldly to you in prayer. As your people may we come boldly to the throne of grace, may you give us abundantly above, exceeding abundantly above, all that we could ask or think. May you bless us, may you change us, and may you use us more and more. And may you work to glorify your name forever and ever. And we thank you once again for this time. We thank you for your word. And of course, we thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.